making Bannock is just such a, like it's a spiritual thing. Making it is just like connecting you with the ingredients and the land. Yeah, taking the brain out yeah. and mixing it. And then that gets rubbed into, into the Right into the hype. Having a lot of people tell me that I wouldn't be able to make it as a cinematographer because the industry isn't inviting to indigenous, to Asian, to women. Tansei, welcome to the second episode of May TV. Your response to our first episode has been overwhelmingly positive. We're back this month to share more stories of Métis culture and identity to continue the education of all Canadians on who Métis are in our province and across the country. We also want to keep you up to date with what's happening behind the scenes at The Nation. With that in mind, I've got our reporter Sophie with me today for the first installment of our new segment, News of the Nation. How are you, Sophie? Hi, Daniel. I'm good, thanks. MNBC celebrated the first annual Wakotoan Day on April 23rd. This was the first official proclamation by MNBC to recognize a day of importance. A formal set of guidelines will be released soon to allow citizens to submit proclamations to be considered by the board. Launched in January, the Wakotoan project is part of the nation's move toward a paperless government that will move all registration online, help with the large backlog of citizenship applications, and significantly improve processing times. As part of the project, new citizenship cards have also been designed. Celebrations for Wakotoan Day 2021 included a gathering of the board to discuss the registry renewal project. T-shirts were also designed and distributed to staff to wear on the day. On June 1st, MNBC will be moving into new offices at Gateway Station in Surrey. The new offices feature more space for the growing number of staff, Métis design motifs and artwork, and a welcoming reception area for guests. The layout and design have been completed in consultation with Métis artists and designers. Métis businesses were also used whenever possible during the build. Keep an eye on our website and social media channels for updated contact information, including the new mailing address. The annual Métis Nation Governing Assembly was held virtually on May 7th and 8th. Acting President Lisa Smith kicked off the annual meeting with an opening speech that highlighted renewed commitments to chartered communities, elders, and citizens across the province. The two-day assembly debated seven resolutions, including the Natural Resources Act, the Electoral Act Committee, and a lively discussion on Métis Youth BC office terms. All seven resolutions passed. Later in the show, we'll hear from a few chartered community presidents about their impressions of the first virtual MNGA. The push to vaccinate Canadians against COVID-19 continued this month with the Golden Ears Métis Society hosting their own Indigenous vaccination clinic. It is the first clinic hosted by a Métis community in BC. The clinic, in partnership with Fraser Health, vaccinated a total of 40 people. All Indigenous people over the age of 12 are now able to register for their vaccine with second doses rolling out soon. May 5th was Red Dress Day, an important day for women, girls, and Two-Spirit in the Indigenous communities, commemorating and bringing awareness to the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit in Canada. For the last 30 years, an average of three Indigenous women or girls has gone missing each week. Some survive and return, but many cases remain unsolved. To bring awareness to the issue of violence against Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit, Red dresses are hung along highways around the province. People are also asked to wear red on this day in a show of solidarity. On May 5th, representatives from the Métis Women's Council wore red and made public pledges in line with the 231 calls to action and 29 Métis-specific calls to justice outlined in the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, 
and 2LGBTQAAI plus report, released last May. Updates on this prolific issue of violence against Indigenous women and girls are expected from the federal government this June. One of the biggest news stories to impact our nation over the last month is the leaked letter written by BCIT's Executive Director of Indigenous Initiatives and Partnerships, Corey Wilson. The letter made highly offensive statements against the right of Métis Nation to claim self-governance in BC. The letter was leaked anonymously to MNBC in April, along with concerns about the respect of Métis students attending the institution. BCIT has since released a joint statement with MNBC and apologized on behalf of the staff member, but Corey Wilson remains in her position. We'll talk more about this later in the show when I'm joined by Susie Hooper, MNBC's Minister of Post-Secondary Education and Environmental Rights. But that's it for this month's News of the Nation segment. Thank you for joining me, Sophie. Thanks for having me, Daniel. Now we're going to take you out of the studio to meet Gillian Brooks, otherwise known as the Métis Bannock Queen. Sophie met with her to learn about how she's putting her grandfather's old Bannock recipe to work for some local charities. Take a look. We're here today in Vancouver's historic Chinatown to meet Gillian Brooks, better known as the Métis Bannock Queen. Making bannock is just such a, like it's a spiritual thing. Making it is just like connecting you with the ingredients and the land and just, you know, thanking the creator when you're making this kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's been really healing for me, honestly, and like kind of connecting myself closer to my grandfather. He was born and raised in Fort McMurray. Um, he worked on the trap line. Just growing up with him, it was pretty incredible. He just, he was just a, a, a well of knowledge and he would always pass on things to us and he was never too shy away from questions. Like, it was really great. Like, we just had the really good dynamic with him. Um, the recipe comes from your grandfather, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You've got it all memorized. Yeah, it, I've been doing it so often now that it's just like, it's just second thought. I used to watch my grandpa do this and he, he could do it like just because <laughs> his hands were so big. He could just fold so much quicker than I can. So you picked it up after your grandfather passed away is when yeah, you started the business? Yes, yeah. I started the Métis Bannock Queen back in the summer of last year. It, it, it just started out as a fundraiser um, and then it just kind of, you know, people still wanted orders and were asking for more and then I had other businesses asking if they could like sell through them. It just kind of took off from there. And what's the reception of it been like? Um, amazing actually, like people on Instagram are like pretty uh, just seeing the posts and retags and stuff of like how people are enjoying it and eating it, it's been really interesting, especially with some of the people like using Nutella or you know, like making like eggs Benedict with them. So it's just been really interesting seeing how people have taken it on and making it part of their family tradition now. The donations to charity, where did that idea come from? My grandmother, she always installed in us, you know, if you're financially able to take care of yourself and help others, it's your duty as a human to do so. I've done Eastside Boxing, I've given them over a thousand dollars. You know, I live in Hogan's Alley, so it was kind of like a no-brainer giving back to the land that I live on. And then when I switched over to the Urban Native Youth Association, I just wanted to start giving back to the community and the people that live here. Where would you like to see the Bannock business go? Like, do you want to keep, do you want to expand? Yeah, I would love to, like, you know, eventually, you know, be in a, a little cafe or, like, people could, you know, come and sit down and, you know, a, an Indigenous-owned business would be amazing. That's delicious. Thank you so much for showing us all yeah, this today. Yeah, of course. Hi, my name is Jillian Brooks, and I am proud to be Métis. It's really hard not to get hungry when you watch that segment on the Bannock Queen. That looked amazing, looked delicious. I know I'm going to be trying some at my first opportunity. We are going to take a short break. When we come back, I'll talk to Susie Hooper, Minister for Post-Secondary Education and Environmental Protection. But first, here is the Machif word for baker. <laughs>
Welcome back. As promised, I'm joined via Zoom by MNBC Minister Susie Hooper to discuss the leaked letter from a BCIT staffer. Minister Hooper, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Minister Hooper, uh, before we get into the BCIT uh, situation, the letter, I wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself to our viewers because I know that many people have probably not had the opportunity to meet you in person. So, Minister Hooper, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Minister Hooper and, and how did you uh, get to be a minister with the Métis Nation government? Like I said, good morning. And my name is Susie Hooper. I, am, uh, I live in Smithers. I am the Northwest Regional Director for the Region 6. I was first um, elected in 2008 as the uh, Northwest Women's Rep for the Northwest Region. And then in 2012, I was acclaimed in as the Northwest Director. And since then, this is coming up to my third term as the Northwest Director for MNBC. We, I, I know there's a very pressing issue, the, the BCIT recently, you uh, issued a letter to uh, Minister Ann King in the province, and you're the Minister of Environment, Environmental Protection and the Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Can you quickly summarize what happened at BCIT and what concerned you and why did you send that letter into the province of British Columbia? So this was brought to our attention by an anonymous Métis person uh, with great concerns that uh, an email had gone out with some offensive language towards Métis. And um, I really respect that person and I really value the fact that they brought it to our attention. And uh, other, if they had not have done that, we would not may not have known this. So an email was sent out, as you know, and it was, uh, we don't know the broad spectrum of where it was sent out, but it was sent out to the public. And uh, in our, um, investigation several people received this email right we're going to just take a, a a brief break we're going to show you a global television clip a news clip on this story that was triggered uh, as a result of Métis Nation BC have a look Fontaine is talking about an email that appears to have been written by BCIT's executive director of indigenous initiatives and partnerships Corey Wilson in the partial copy obtained by Global News, date and recipients unknown, Wilson appears to write, quote, having an Indigenous ancestor or relative does not an Indigenous person make. And of particular interest to us in B.C. is the recent Métis declaration that they are a nation within B.C. I can see jockeying for position, money, and voice for Indigenous people in B.C., End quote. I had thought that we had moved well beyond that in terms of a discussion around self-government and the rights of Métis people in British Columbia, but clearly we have not. So, Minister, uh, you just saw that story there from, from Global News. Obviously, it's, you're, you're, this issue is generating lots of attention. Where do you want it to go from here? Like, you've obviously raised attention at BCIT. You, you've, you've asked for some changes. What next? Well... Uh we have uh, we've made a significant investment um, to support our students that have attended BCIT. We we want more than a simple apology. At minimum, we have four. Uh, we put four recommendations. One of them is Métis cultural awareness training for all BCIT staff, Métis-led review of Indigenous 101 curriculum, Indigenous modules, and a broader Indigenous indigenization program offered at BCIT. We'd also like an independent review of all of this. We'd also like to accelerate the implementation of an anti-racism legislation and the activation of the anti-racism hotline before post-secondary students come back to school in the fall. And we would also like some data on our students attending a BCIT. How are they doing? How can we support them? We have no data. So Minister, how confident are you and the Cabinet that this letter and these requests are going to be acted upon by BCIT now that they have been provided to both the Minister and to the President of BCIT? How confident are you that they're going to be implemented in any a short period of time? I don't have that much confidence in it. I would like to say yes, there's going to happen, but we need, uh, we, more, we need more of a dialogue. We need some more to uh, come out of this. We don't. We don't want it just to be shut down at a letter and an apology. We want something to come from this. We've got 30 seconds left, but I understand, Minister, that you've also had people reach out to you, to members of the cabinet, to the government. Uh, once this story broke, that there's other issues of racism, and you're, I think, believe you're calling for a more broad uh, review of post-secondary institutions in British Columbia. Is that not correct? 
totally. Uh, we would like uh, a report similar to the report that Mary Ellen Trapel Lafont put out on the racism in the healthcare system. The emails and the phone calls that we've received, I've received uh, from many students wanting to tell their story. And some of them are, are horrific and we that needs to be improved. And I know we're just seeing a small percentage that have reached out so far and many more will be reaching out to us. So I encourage people to reach out to us and, and so that they can be heard. And for our viewers who aren't familiar with the Mary Ellen Trapelafon report, that was a review of systemic racism in healthcare. And I know, Minister, you've been very vocal about uh, the uh, province perhaps moving forward and doing a similar type of review in the post secondary uh, institutions. Is that not correct? Yes, it is correct. I think, uh, and I think it was brought up by Mary Ellen Trapelafont that um, throughout the healthcare racism review, she heard many. Uh, uh, reviews of racism within the post-secondary education. And she um, herself said to us that she would like to see something come from the post-secondary education, a review for racism that is currently happening. Great, thank you so much, Minister uh, Susie Hooper, coming to us from Smithers, British Columbia. Beautiful Smithers, British Columbia. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be with us today. So nice to learn more about our ministers on a more personal level. We're taking a short break now, and when we come back, Lisa Shepard talks to Métis Elder Marie Bercier. From being adopted, I went into the residential school. From the residential school, I went to live with Auntie Mary. Now, that's the sister of the woman who adopted me. She taught me to care, not so much about myself, but about everything around me. Welcome back. Traditional knowledge is a crucial aspect of keeping Métis culture alive. Lisa Shepard feels this more than most, using her art and relationships to learn as much traditional knowledge as she can. She joins me now to discuss this month's segment. Lisa, Tanse. Hi, Daniel. So Lisa, this month you uh, interview a woman by the name of Marie Bercier. Who is Marie Bercier? Uh, Marie is somebody who's been involved in the community for such a long time. She was one of the founding members of Fraser Valley Métis Association. She was a mentor with the Métis Community Support Worker Program at the University of Fraser Valley, and she's a volunteer with the Abbotsford School District. Wow, she sounds like a very, uh, very busy person. And I know she references, uh, our viewers will see this, somebody named Jim. Who is Jim? Jim is her life partner. And he's in the background, but he's always supporting her. And we always see Jim around the community when Marie's there. That's awesome. So, Lisa, why don't we uh, get to meet Marie Bercier? So, Marie, I've known you forever, it seems like. I was going to ask you, did you always know that you were Métis? No. 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 So when no. did you find out? 99, I got my genealogy done. So that wasn't really that long ago. No, no. Yeah. But when I went through it, I was so amazed and 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 flabbergasted really to find this out about myself because it gave me a sense of a foundation that I could stand on hmm. rather than just myself. Okay. I was taken away when I was not even 18 months old. I see. Okay. Now I've heard that I was given away. I heard that I was a taken away. From being adopted, I went into the residential school. From the residential school, I went to live with Auntie Mary. Now, that's the sister of the woman who adopted me. She taught me to care, not so much about myself, but mm. about everything around me. She taught me, taught me about the dream catcher, and, and she taught me how to cook without a recipe book. And her favorite, was when Uncle would kill a pig and, and it, before it went in the ice house, she would grind up some of the meat and she'd make like hamburger. Mm -hmm. And then she would put it in a pot <laughs> and, and with, with onions and garlic Hamburgers and potatoes. <laughs> well, she called it Napu. What is it? Napu. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what that means? No, I don't have a clue. 
from the time I came to live with her when I was nine till I was 10, um, just coming out of the residential school, I, I, um, it was a good life. Marie, when but you, something that, that probably a lot of people aren't aware of with you, like because you're so involved in the community and people know the things that you do. Yes. A lot of people probably aren't aware of how old you were when you went back to college. I wanted to show you my certificate. It's a, a, with distinction. So you were 56 when I you went 56. back to college, and yes. you went out of province for that. Yes, I went to, uh, to Alberta. Yeah, it's northern Alberta to Lackawish. <laughs> okay, and actually, and tell me about what you what you did in college. Like, what were you there for? But I learned to do um, high tan. Well, I saw Auntie and Uncle doing the high tanning. I mean, I did on uh, when I was with them, but to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And they, they have this, it's like a, almost like a stepladder that they put the hide yeah. on. And I fell off on this. I put my foot on some slime and slimy innards and slid off. The <laughs> I just You're not going to forget that <laughs> lesson. No. And we brain tanned. Yes. And Elsie had... Which is... Which is Taking brain, the brain, brain, tan, brain, yeah, taking the brain out yeah. and mixing it, and then that gets rubbed into the into hide. right into the hide. Yes, and for what and purpose? Then, and well, it softens it. Mm -hmm. If you could go back in time right now and have tea with Auntie Mary, oh my goodness, what would you say to I her? Will someday. What would you ask or say or tell or share? <laughs> I like that. I will someday. My, That's a great answer too. My 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 favorite thing with Auntie Mary was braiding her hair. Hmm. She had hair that I'm sure was down past her knees, and and uh, and when she wore it, she wore it up on top of her head, all curled up, just yeah. like a crown. And for her, that was her crown. Oh, nice. And yeah, probably make the poop. <laughs> <laughs> You'd ask her to make that dish, <laughs> and we would share it with some bannock or or, or fresh bread or something. That's. <laughs> So this is the fun part. You talked about Auntie Mary making bread and I was so happy that you said that because what I have for you here, Marie, is baked fresh this morning, oh sourdough, oh. and that's full of harvested spruce tips. Wait till you smell that. Oh, oh my girl, oh my God. Oh, doesn't that just smell like oh, like sourdough <laughs> and like citrus? Because the spruce yeah. tips have citrus, oh. like as if you were camping and eating it at the same time. But wait, it oh. gets better. Wait till Jim comes home. <laughs> I have something else here for oh you. Oh my gosh! So, oh my Marie, girl. I made this for you because you've been oh. such an inspiration with the oh. things that you teach in your community. You know, not just to myself, but to other people in the community. So this is a little pouch. You can use it for what you will. You can hang it on the wall and put what you want in it. And it's got your initials in the back. <laughs> and I'll let you open it up and see what's inside. Oh. Because it connects to Auntie Mary too. And it's like it was meant to be. Jim is going to be so happy when he will comes Will you make home? sure Jim leaves you a slice? Oh, he will, he will. <laughs> I'll get the first slice. Oh, I know what this is. It's cotton with <laughs> bear grease. You and your salves. I love you. I love you. I really enjoyed that segment, uh, particularly on a personal note, because I used to have Napoop as a kid, and I did not know that that's what it was called, but it was absolutely delicious. We've got another break, but when we come back, I will talk to three chartered community presidents about surviving COVID in remote communities. But before that, here is the Machif word for religion. Welcome back. COVID-19 has had a severe impact on us all. It has limited this show's ability to travel to our Métis communities outside of the Lower Mainland for this episode. But it has also had a severe and unique impact on our chartered communities. To discuss this, I'm joined by three chartered community presidents. 
Kelly Roberts of the Prince George Métis Community Association, Cheryl Dobman of Kelowna Métis Association, and Pixie Wells, President of the Fraser Valley Métis Association. Welcome to all three of you. So we're going to start off this initial segment by obviously focusing a little bit on COVID-19 and the impact that the pandemic has had within your communities. And I'm going to maybe start off with, with uh, Cheryl, if I could. Cheryl, what has been the impact to you uh, in your, you're in Kelowna, so what's been the impact to you in your community of COVID-19? Well, it's really slowed us down from meeting, of course, because we have to stay separate. Um, but we've uh, had a lot of need. A lot of our people are really struggling um, because of the economic economics and then staying at home, especially our elders are stuck at home. Uh, so that's really been tough. And what about you, Kelly? What's, what's been your perspective? How have your, how's your community coped with the pandemic? Not being able to do social gatherings. Uh, a lot of the elders look forward to some of our gatherings that we hold every year which is then playing on the mental health of not only the elders, but everybody in general. And Pixie, you're in the Fraser Valley. You're very close to the heart, what we would call almost the epicenter of, of COVID-19 in British Columbia. What's been the impact to your community? The impact for our community is, um, as you're hearing from other communities, is, is the opportunity to gather and be together. Um, so we're, we're working as much as possible to be, to be able to hopefully come back together again. Now, as chartered communities, you're all volunteer-based, so you're all doing this eff effectively on volunteer hours. Uh, what have been some of the types of services that you've implemented to help your citizens to cope with the pandemic? And Kelly, perhaps I'll start with you in Prince George. Um, with the COVID relief funding and now we were, we're been assisting our members with grocery cards, uh, medical expenses, um, pretty much whatever we can do to assist or help alleviate some of the pressures uh, that have arised from COVID. If we can't directly help them, we try to help find the facilities that can help them. And is that, what's been your experience with that, Cheryl? Is this similar in terms of your community in the Okanagan? Very similar. We have a couple of our board members who have been a part of, of passing out, um, especially to the people that are reaching out to us and those we have reached out to as well. Knowing our people, uh, a fair amount of them, it's pretty simple and easy to know who's really in need and ensuring that they get what they need to help through this time is, has been hugely important. And Pixie, what about you? Well, I'm echoing the same statement. Um, however, we, we, like you said, we live sort of in the, the urban, more urban center. So uh, ours has been a little bit more focused on helping with the vaccine clinics and also working very, very much within our city to see what other organizations we can help out or what they can do for us as well. And Pixie, how are people feeling? Like how, when, when people ask you, what's the morale right now? We're into this, you know, well over a year now, this pandemic. You're on the ground, you're talking to Métis people there in the Fraser Valley. How are people feeling? From my perspective and from my understanding, from what I take away from what most people are speaking is that the mental health and the, the well-being is definitely of urgency to, to most of us. And I think that uh, getting back out on the land and being able to come back together is going to be a great relief for a lot of our people. Now, uh, Pixie mentioned mental health. Uh, Cheryl or Kelly, do you guys want to jump in on that? Is that something that, that's been on your radar in terms of the people's mental health in your communities? I think it really has, especially um, the, the loss of the gathering has really, really hit us hard. Um, so, so being that we're very grateful for Zoom and meeting in that form, even just to do craft circles, um, sit around, do some beating and, and just visiting has been good, um, but we also did a bit of a, a lesson on midshift, learning midshift on, online has been great too. That sounds awesome, and Kelly? I echo what Pixie has said in regards to that. Um, the biggest issue is the gathering aspect. A lot of our elders rely and look forward to our Indigenous Day and our Christmas celebration. Those are their two major outings every year. And with the restrictions on gatherings, we haven't been able to do that. A lot of our elders are not computer literate. So there's that aspect of it as well, which then comes again, plays back onto the mental health aspect. Mm -hmm. They're not being able to get out to socialize. So it, it's an ongoing issue. 
Before we go to break, just perhaps the last question to Pixie. Uh, Pixie, in terms of uh, vaccine hesitation, we've heard that some people are a little bit hesitant about taking uh, the, the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. What have you guys done in the Fraser Valley to encourage Métis people to get vaccinated? Well, we started with a newsletter, our very first one, and uh, at the bottom we put a small blurb about um, the vaccine clinics and getting your vaccine um, shot. But we've also been participating in the vaccine clinic here in Abbotsford and hopefully um, helping promote um, getting your vaccine shot for those of them that, um, that are, might be a little bit hesitant to so making it a little more Métis specific. We'll continue our discussion with the presidents after a short break. Meanwhile, here is the Machif word for accommodate. <laughs> Welcome back. We're back with our panel of chartered community presidents. I'd like to pivot the discussion from COVID uh, to talk a little bit more about the first ever virtual MNGA, Métis Nation Governing Assembly, and what it's been like to have big events like this and the annual general meeting virtually. So joining me on the panel, we have the three chartered community presidents, and I know, I believe all three of you actually attended the recent MNGA, the Governing Assembly. What was it like to do it virtually? Cheryl, what was your perspective? It was kind of interesting. It was kind of neat to be able to, it was neat to be able to see all the people out there and, and talking and standing up for what we all believe in. That's one thing I find amazing is that us as Métis people always do stand up for ourselves. Um, so it was, I'm so grateful that we were able to do it. And Kelly, did you get any uh, feedback? I know the annual general meeting was virtual, so a number of your citizens would have participated, the governing assembly was virtual. You getting any feedback from the community around that in terms of um, their ability to participate perhaps in, in uh, Métis Nation events that they were never able to do before because they couldn't travel to places like the Lower Mainland? Yeah, with the AGM and that, there was quite a bit of feedback in that. And uh, the basic consensus that I've heard is a lot of people liked it simply because of not being able to afford the travel aspect. With the MNGA, the, the live streaming and that, that was good. I haven't really received a lot of feedback other than some of my board members in regards to it. Um, but personally, small events, I don't mind it. Larger events, I don't like it. Um, mm -hmm. My personal take on it is I like the networking aspect that happens in between sessions. And it's hard to do when you're doing it virtual. Now, Pixie, COVID has obviously impacted Métis Nation BC's ability to bring everyone together, as we've seen with the annual general meeting and the MNGA. How has COVID impacted you in terms of a chartered community being able to not have those gatherings and to be able to plan when you never know when you're going to be able to get a uh, gathering again? How have you guys coped with that uh, in the Fraser Valley? One of the things that we've been doing um, to work harder with our city and it's given us an opportunity to um, work with other uh, community partners and uh, moving forward, uh, we're hoping to do more of that within our community to bring a larger aspect to our community for our people. And Cheryl, what's your thoughts on that? Um, just working towards bringing it together is right. Um, just just putting it out there and hoping that things get better soon so that we can get a little bit, well, I know we won't get back to normal, but that we can start gathering because that's really the loss for our, our community as a whole, get to know each other and, and just be together like we're supposed to be, in my opinion. So Cheryl, from a logistical perspective from your community, what, what have you had to do with technology in order to stay connected? Because clearly you're not able to, to gather anymore. And as you said, that's so fundamental and at the heart of, of Métis people. So when you're not able to physically get together, what have been some, have you seen or heard of some innovations around that in terms of getting people together using technology? Well, the whole Zoom platform is key. It's definitely been almost a saving grace for us, for sure. Um, we find that we're using a little bit more of the, the Facebook platform. Um, it may leave some people out because they're more into, say, Twitter or Instagram or all those things. But social media has been huge for us. Um, super important to, 
when you can't gather personally, that's why you have to depend on for sure. So before I wrap up, I'm gonna maybe just do a pivot and a fun question to all three of you. The pandemic is over. Uh, the pandemic has been declared over. In, in less than 20 seconds, what's the one thing you're going to do post pandemic that you have not been able to do in the last year or so? I'm gonna start with you, Kelly. Post the gathering, like or a dinner or something to get everyone together. And what about you, Pixie? Well, I sort of echo that statement, but I think, I, I, you know, I was going to say go large or stay home. So I'm going to go big and hopefully we can have <laughs> a few regions from people from our region, region two, like Chilliwack, Fraser Valley, Gems, our whole region get together and, and have a Métis, Métis party. Wonderful. And, and Cheryl? I, I'm in on that. As a matter of fact, I know it's not very far to go to Prince George or Chilliwack or Abbotsford. I think I might be considering going there too and having you guys come to us. So getting together is what we need to do. I miss the potlucks. No, that's awesome. And I, I want to thank the three of you, Cheryl, uh, Pixie, Kelly, for participating in our first Chartered Community President's Panel. When we come back, Sophie meets Kayla Wachelle, an inspiring young cinematographer. What drives me currently in my career has been a lot of no's and having a lot of people tell me that I wouldn't be able to make it as a cinematographer because the industry isn't inviting to Indigenous, to Asian, to women. Welcome back. On May TV, we will always endeavor to showcase youth of the Métis Nation and their talents. Today, we're going to meet a young woman who's making her mark on the Canadian film scene. For this segment, we're here in Burnaby to meet Kayla Wachelle, a 27-year-old Métis filmmaker. For myself, uh, starting as a cinematographer in, in Vancouver, like I've never met another Indigenous uh, female cinematographer that's working full time that can say that they pay all their bills from cinematography um, or an Asian cinematographer. Or right now I think I only know four female cinematographers working and that was really hard at the start thinking like how can I do this, how can I pay off my student loans, how can I survive. Did you grow up knowing that you were Métis? Yes, I did. I was really fortunate to um, learn of my Métis heritage from my father and my grandmother. Yeah, she definitely believed that your birthday and your name determined who you are as a person. Like an example of this would be um, our last name, Wachelle, was originally Wackel, um, and she changed it to Wachelle, and I feel like that was also her determining her own family. My mother immigrated here um, from Okinawa. Even at a young age, I, I would actually think about my Métis ancestors and think like, wow, like what I'm experiencing today is probably what they experienced like 100 years ago. As someone who appears mixed as well, I constantly had people say, what are you? And that type of language really hurt me as a child. And why do you think that question hurts being asked, uh, what are you? Uh, because it's kind of dehumanizing in a sense and it's also like placing this expectation on, upon a person and asking them for knowledge in a very like abrupt way that isn't very inviting. <laughs> Square on the TV here. Uh, <laughs> we need an insert shot of the cord. As someone who's mixed, um, who connects to all these different cultures, it was definitely a hard time growing up and feeling slightly broken at times. Am I okay to see myself as an Asian individual and also a Métis individual? It's a constant battle with just recognizing that other people see you how they see you and you can't change that. Um, so with my art, I just really try to be honest with who I am. I blew up this photo just because I feel like it represents the type of work I want to continue to do. Uh, it's during Portraits of a Fire, and uh, we just had these uh, two little girls passing us while we were filming some exteriors, uh, and they just sat down with my first AC, Diana, 
and we're looking at the monitor and Trevor, the director, took this photo and I just thought, oh, like that's what I want filmmaking to be. I want it to be super inviting. Because um, normally on a film set, if two kids were passing by, people would tell them to go home. Um, to, they wouldn't invite them to look at the monitor. So I'm just really happy for this moment. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that you've worked on that you have, um, you've done a lot of work in with other Indigenous filmmakers? Um, currently right now we're just finishing post-production on Portraits from a Fire, which is a film directed by Trevor Mack and produced by Kay Kroll and uh, Ryland Friday. And it's like a film that I'm so proud of and it's about this um, Indigenous boy who learns about a family secret through these past um, videotapes. Um, and I just really can't wait for people to see it. I think people are really going to relate to the character. Um, and it's a film that will inspire uh, so many people. What drives me currently in my career has been a lot of no's and having a lot of people tell me that I wouldn't be able to make it as a cinematographer because the industry isn't inviting to Indigenous, to Asian, to women. You recently had a career advancement. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So at the moment, there's currently very few female cinematographers um, signed with agencies, with cinematography agencies. Um, and I'm very grateful that last month I was able to announce that I signed with Mantle Rips um, in Toronto and it's a goal of mine that I didn't think would come to fruition for another 10 years. It's really amazing for me to be on that roster um, and I'm really excited to see where it takes me. Hi, I'm Kayla Wachelle and I'm proud to be Métis. What an inspiring story. I'm sure you'll agree on a young Métis cinematographer very much looking forward to seeing her productions when they come out. Métis strives to showcase Métis culture, heritage and contributions to all Canadians. If you would like to be featured on this show, get in touch. You can also watch repeat airings of Métis every Saturday at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Joy TV as well as 6 p.m. local time on Faith TV. A special hello to all of our friends in Winnipeg. Also, you can watch entire episodes on our website. I will see you next time. Until then, be safe and mina kuapamitan.